the technology industry is in, is primarily based in Silicon Valley, and most of the people are are pretty liberal, and so there there would be sort of that that liberal skew. But it, but for I'd say most of the evolution of these big tech companies, they saw themselves as neutral uh, platforms, uh, and they they didn't see themselves as partisans engaged in a political battle. Um, they merely wanted to create the the tools and the platforms for other people to communicate. And I think something changed. Uh, if I had to sort of pinpoint when it changed, it would have been around 2016, mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when Trump got elected. I think that uh, a lot of big tech bought into the argument that they had sort of caused uh, Trump to, to, to be elected. <laughs> And joining me today is the former COO of PayPal, an angel investor in such companies as Facebook, Uber, and SpaceX, the founder of Kraft Ventures, and a co-host of the All In podcast. David Sachs, welcome to the Rubin Report. Yeah, great to be here. I'm glad to have you. You know, when I was looking through all your bios and Wikipedia, which I'm sure is all perfectly true and all that good stuff, there's a lot of stuff I could have pulled there for the bio, and I was thinking for the for my young audience watching this, like basically being part of all of those things kind of seems like the coolest thing possible. So how does somebody get into all of that? Yeah, I mean, I was lucky to uh, graduate Stanford in 1994, which was the year before the internet really kind of took off. And I was lucky enough to meet Peter Thiel when I was there. And we collaborated together on, you know, we both worked on the the uh, student newspaper, the, the sort of conservative libertarian student newspaper that Peter founded. And then we ended up writing a book together. And he recruited me years later to join PayPal. And, um, you know, I actually thought I had missed the whole Internet thing. And then I got a call from Peter in 1999. And he told me about this company he was creating. And, uh, you know, that, that company went on to become PayPal. And he recruited me to be the COO. Do you so, think, yeah, that's how I kind of got into it. Yeah, do you think Peter or you or Alan, like did anyone realize what any of this stuff was gonna become or just when it's unfolding, you just kind of run with it and see what happens? You know, it, at the time we, we, we sort of knew on a, like a certain level that it was changing the world. Like at PayPal, we had this user counter that would track the user growth. We called it the World Domination Index. <laughs> So on a certain level, we kind of, you know, thought it was taking over the world. But on another level, we didn't quite, you know, un understand it. It felt a little bit like fantasy or something. Um, so, so yeah, it was like, you know, it, 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 it definitely operated on both levels. Yeah. How much of PayPal was just trying to get people to, like, understand you could do things differently? Like, I, I literally remember... The first time I saw PayPal, I had moved into a new apartment with a couple roommates. I was a struggling comic. I barely had any money. And one of my roommates said to me, you got to pay me on PayPal for the rent. And I, I didn't even know what that meant. Like the idea that I could link a bank account to something online. And I don't even think we had Wi-Fi yet. Like it was still wired to wall. Like just getting people to like understand there's new ways of doing things. Like how much of it is just that? A, a big part of it. And then the the other big part of it was just making it really easy to actually do it. So, you know, we, it, it's a lot easier now. We didn't have all the tools, you know, that we, that we have now 20 years ago. And so just getting the product to be super simple. So you could put it in an email address, put in your credit card number and it would send the money and then you'd get it and be able to take your bank account. I mean, it sounds really easy, but there, you know, there's all this friction in the way that had to be removed. And I think part of the reason why we were successful is we, we were able just to make it like incredibly simple. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, the diversity myth, and I've I've talked to Peter on the show, and you guys wrote this book, 1995. In essence, you you wrote this at Stanford. You guys kind of predicted everything that was happening that's happening right now. Like really, the the idea that that sort of the the diversity of immutable characteristics would matter more than the diversity of thought which we now see just rampaging through all our businesses and institutions and the political sphere and everything. How did you guys see it coming? Well, we had, we had been you know, writing on the, the Stanford Review and Stanford was sort of the epicenter that there was a famous protest in 1988 where Jesse Jackson led a, led a, a, a mob that was chanting, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western culture's gotta go. So Stanford was sort of the, the epicenter for, 
for a lot of that stuff. And um, so we were writing about it as, as student journalists in a way, and, and that book was an extension of the student journalism we had done. Um, you know, looking back, I mean, I was a, a teenager when uh, we, we wrote a lot of that. I wouldn't necessarily make all the same arguments the same way that I did back then, but I do think we were ahead of the curve in realizing, you know, this um, this growing illiberalism, you know, this, this sort of political correctness now it's you know called cancel culture where uh where you know they're, they're, we're putting restrictions on people's ability to speak and to think and uh to express themselves in ways that i think would have been um uh, w w that that certainly you know 1960s liberals w wouldn't have um you know wouldn't wouldn't have supported and so you know i never i never necessarily saw, saw myself as a conservative i saw myself as more of like a 1960s style liberal who believed in free speech and, you know, a colorblind society. I know, I know the feeling, man. <laughs> I, I think we're on a similar journey here yeah. uh, with, with these issues. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it was, it was the illiberalism on campus that sort of pushed me to become more politically aware. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that's what the book was about. And, and now really the whole country is like, um, it was like Andrew Sullivan says, we all live on campus now. Right, because it's kind of funny to me. You guys were writing about this in 95 and say when I was talking about some of this stuff five years ago, so you know, 20 years after you wrote about it, people kept saying to me, no, no, it's just gonna stay on campuses. And when they get to the real world, the real world will show them. And uh, no, well, those, that did not work students, out. Those students graduated, you know, and uh, and they took those ideologies into the places where, where they went. And uh, so, you know, they took them to the, you know, a lot of those graduates went off to run school boards or to run, uh, you know, newspapers, the New York Times and, you know, places like that. I mean, this is it's a very elite um, uh, philosophy or ideology that's being um, imposed. And it's, it's coming from places like, you know, Stanford and other uh, Ivy League type type schools. Yeah, so you've been big on sort of the three topics that at least for me at the moment are, are my big three topics, which are, are big tech, COVID, and then California specifically, because I think there's COVID at a sort of national and worldwide level and then California. So we'll hold that for a moment. But on, on the big tech stuff, you know, I, I started talking about free speech a couple of years ago. And then there was suddenly this feeling that we were kind of being censored, but we couldn't figure it out. Then we started hearing phrases like shadow banning and de-boosting and algorithmic fairness, all of these things. And I think one of the things that people wonder about is how this all infected all of, seemingly all of the big tech companies. Do you, you have any theories on where it sort of started in there and, and how it became so inclusive? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the, the technology industry is in, is primarily based in Silicon Valley and most of the people are are pretty liberal. And so there there would be sort of that that liberal skew. But it, but from I'd say most of the evolution of these big tech companies, they saw themselves as neutral uh, platforms. Uh, and they they didn't see themselves as partisans engaged in a political battle. Um, they merely wanted to create the the tools and the platforms for other people to communicate. And I think something changed. Uh, if I had to sort of pinpoint when it changed, it would have been around 2016. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when when Trump got elected, I think that uh, a lot of big tech bought into the argument that they had sort of caused. Uh, Trump to, to to be elected, or you know that th that sort of disinformation, you know, had been used through their platforms, and that this had resulted in the election of Trump, and so therefore they could no longer just be neutral; they would have to take corrective measures to prevent this uh, this disinformation. And I think that was sort of the, the the beginning of it, where again, the 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 I think big tech sort of bought into this idea. I think they were predisposed to buying into it because they were liberal, but they were never as partisan as they subsequently became over the last few years. It's not that dissimilar from, I think, what happened with the news industry. You know, there were people like Brent Bazell for years who were doing studies showing that 90 plus percent mm -hmm. of reporters were liberal, voted Democrat, and so on. But they believed in a, a code, a journalistic code of objectivity or neutrality. 
And somehow, you know, over uh, over the last four years, Trump was perceived as such a threat that, you know, the media decided that it was more important to stop Trump than to live up to this sort of this code of, of neutrality. And I think something similar happened in, in big tech as well. Yeah. Has it been tough for you as someone that isn't purely a leftist, regardless of how you fully define yourself, but you're not, you're clearly not purely a leftist, but to be in San Francisco and, and still be around a lot of that. I mean, right now we know that a ton of people, the whole, the whole biz, the whole industry is fleeing to Miami. Miami's looking pretty good right now to have some open conversations. Well, yeah, I mean, so uh, no, I mean, there's been no re reprisals or anything like that. But I do think that people feel like they can't say, you know, exactly what they think. I do think that people feel um, uncomfortable expressing a view that's not the prevailing, you know, the prevailing views. And uh, so for me, part of the reason why I started doing the all in pod and started speaking out more is just to show people that they could speak out. Um, because the gap between what makes sense and what people feel comfortable has never been greater. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look back on 2020, I mean, just to name a few issues, I mean, these protracted lockdowns that, you know, aren't substantiated by science. I mean, they're just kind of crazy. The idea of defunding or abolishing the police. I mean, you can, you know, believe that we need to have controls on the use of violence by police, but just to say that we should just abolish the, the mm -hmm. police or, or, um, or, or defund them, or to empty out the jails, as a, which is happening now in, in San Francisco and, and we'll, LA. We'll get to your it's, DA in a little bit. Don't worry about that. So those are some features for me. But but what struck me is not just like that these ideas are just so crazy and sort of off base, but just that nobody felt comfortable saying these things. And so I felt a little bit of an obligation to speak out more because you know economically, I you know I, if I get canceled, I'm still going to be fine. You know. Um, I'm not, I'm in a, I'm in a position where, I mean, I don't know if I can be canceled, but, um, but if I can, I'm my, you know, economically I'm gonna be fine. So, um, so I, I felt like we need more people to speak up, you know, speak out so that everybody feels comfortable and they don't feel like they're just going crazy if they're, you know, not in favor of, of defunding the police or something like that. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about tech instead of nonstop yelling, check out our tech playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out our full episode playlist. They're right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.